Hey there, it's Mira, Anka's AI avatar. Today on Events Demystified, your podcast host and producer, Anka, is chatting with Leanne Calderwood, your go-to guru for all things LinkedIn and personal branding. Ever wondered how to make your mark in the crowded event planning scene? Leanne's got us covered with real down-to-earth advice on making your personal brand pop, staying true to your passion, and nailing that social media game, especially on LinkedIn. We're also demystifying the big question. How do you keep your brand shining without burning out? It's all about balancing that professional sparkle with some much-needed self-care. Whether you're an introvert struggling to be heard or just looking for ways to jazz up your content with AI, this quick chat is packed with tips you won't want to miss. So tune in and discover how to make your personal brand work for you. Don't forget to subscribe and get notified of all of our newest episodes as they air out on Spotify and our YouTube channel. Welcome to Events Demystified Podcast, where we explore and demystify the world of in-person, virtual, hybrid event AV production and technology by sharing insightful tips, tricks, and tactics to make your events a success. This podcast is brought to you by Tree Fan Events, a woman-owned boutique event production agency. And your host is Anka Trifan, a technical event planner and producer with almost two decades of hands-on technical experience in event production. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Events Demystified podcast brought to you by Trifan Events. I'm your host, Anka Platon Trifan, and today we are peeling back the layers on a topic that's close to my heart and critical for anyone looking to carve out a unique space in the competitive events industry. It's all about the power and necessity of personal branding. In an era where standing out is more important than ever, how do you create a brand that's truly yours, one that resonates with your audience and separates you from the crowd. To help us navigate these waters, we're joined by an extraordinary guest, Leanne Calderwood. Leanne isn't just a, any expert. She's a force to be reckoned with in the realms of LinkedIn and personal branding. And as someone, someone who identifies herself as a raging introvert and an obsessive tea drinker, Leanne has used her unique perspective to redefine what personal branding means in the event industry. She's a perfect example of how authenticity, passion, and a clear strategy can transform challenges into triumphs. Leanne's journey is nothing short of inspiring from her early days, recognizing the need to stand out without resorting to cold calling, to building a thriving six-figure figure business, she has dared to do things differently. Her approach to branding, emphasizing that it's easy, authentic, and accessible to all, has not only propelled her own career, but also has inspired countless others to take the leap and start building their personal brands. So if you ever wonder how do you build a personal brand that aligns with who you are and where you want to go, or if you're curious about how an introvert has mastered the art of branding in this extroverted world of events and business, you're in for a treat. So stay tuned because we're ready to get this conversation started with our guest today. Leanne, welcome to the show. Hi, Anka. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Well, I'm super excited to do the same. Last time we saw each other was at IMAX and we had a nice conversation. We even had you uh, come on a little post IMAX reel and share your thoughts on how that show went. So today it's going to be a completely different conversation. But before we dive into the depths of personal branding, as I have alluded in the beginning, I'd love to kick things off on a lighter note. You've shared that you're an obsessive teacher. Trigger. I'm curious if you could compare your personal branding journey to a tea blend, which would it be and why? Well, well, that's a great question. I think I would have to choose Earl Grey, which is always the standby classic. 
Yeah, it's known worldwide. It's the tea that most people partake in when they're doing an after tea adventure at a hotel or a tea shop. And it's just one of those recognizable scents. So I guess it's almost like having a personal brand where Earl Grey, everyone kind of knows what it's about. And it's such a classic and beautiful blend. It's one of my favorites. I have never really been just like a tea drinker, but if you mix that in a, say, a London fog, and I know there's only particular teas that can create a really good London fog, I'm all for it. And I remember the first time I tried it, I was like, huh, this is different. This is a good different. I think I'm going to like this drink. So I love the comparison. <laughs> it's It's fascinating how, you know, there's so much variety and also death that can be found both in the tea and the personal branding, as you just explained. I guess it really sets the stage for our deep dive into what does it take? What is it? And how do you build a brand that truly reflects who you are? So Mm -hmm. Let's start by exploring the origins of your personal branding journey. Let's start Mm -hmm. with the beginning. When did you decide to start building your brand and what really sparked that decision? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for asking. So it started when I flipped the switch in my own meetings and events career. And I went from being a meeting and event professional. I was a corporate planner. And I dipped my toe into the world of site selection or meeting brokerage. And I was very excited to do this. And this is going back 17 years. Very excited for this change because the things I loved about meeting planning was building relationships with our partners, doing those hotel contracts. I know most people hate doing the contracts, but I really enjoyed doing them. And so meeting brokerage sounded like a really cool thing for me to do. I could do all the things that I loved and I didn't have to do those things that I didn't enjoy about planning anymore. The problem was though, when I became a meeting broker, I actually had to find my own clients, which means I had to start to learn how to be a salesperson. And as a raging introvert, sales and cold calls never came naturally to me. And it certainly wasn't going to come naturally to me now that I was forced to do it. And so I did it reluctantly and I did learn how to get better, but it was always this massive knot in my stomach selling the traditional ways. Back in the day, it was all done through cold calls. We were taught how to pick up the phone and have those conversations. And my innate temperament, I didn't want to talk on the phone. I wanted to talk to friends. I wanted to talk to my clients, but I didn't want to talk to strangers. And so about a year after doing that, I thought there's got to be a better way to grow my business. And so it wasn't a decision where I woke up Anka and said, oh, today I'm going to start a personal brand. And I think think back then that wasn't even a concept. No, it wasn't a concept. And even today, I think people, we need to bring them into, let's start some activities versus, hey, boom, I'm going to start a brand. But the activity I started to do 17 years ago, or I guess 16 years ago, is I jumped on Twitter. So Twitter was only a couple years old at that point. And the event profs hashtag was fairly new. And so I kind of created my brand about being someone who was first on that event profs platform and started tweeting about event industry trends and happenings. And I would tweet when I was at events not knowing where this was going to go, but I knew I just had to reach people in a different way. And once you know it, Anka, it actually started to stick. I would show up at events like IMAX in Frankfurt or like WEC, and people will go, hey, aren't you L Calderwood, which is my hashtag on Twitter or my username on Twitter. Right. And, and that started conversations. So I no longer had to start these cold conversations, people started approaching me to say hi or do whatever it is. And it was really then that I kind of clicked, it clicked that, yes, I can have conversations that are warm. I don't have to be that cold call salesperson. We can have warm conversations because I'm starting to impact them in a different way. It was through Twitter at the time. Now it's through LinkedIn, but we can reach our audience in a different way 
than those traditional sales methods. And that really was the precipice of starting a brand. I had to do things differently because I was going to drown if I had to do things the traditional way. I love the story. And I love the fact that, you know, out of need comes innovation, right? Like, you look at, okay, what works and what doesn't? And how can I do something that's different? Because just doing this the old school way, it's not serving me. And I feel like that's where, you know, growth can happen. And I love that story. I I I, I remember when I dive myself into this personal branding idea. I don't think I called it that way. I didn't know what it was. Um, And it wasn't as early as you have, but this is what's going to actually lead us into the next question. I remember like starting to create content of my own and starting to put my thoughts out there separate from the organization that I was working at at the time. And it wasn't in conflict with what they were saying. It was just, this is my original thoughts. You guys have your philosophy on how to do things, how to do events, how to do event productions, but I have my personal top thoughts as well. And I want to share those, you know, and Mm -hmm. lo and behold, before you know it, people start, you know, listening and they're interested to hear, you know, okay, so what else do you think about this? What else do you know about this? Right. So Mm -hmm. when it comes to event Mm -hmm. professionals or professionals in general, especially introverts, because I consider myself an ambivert, I can be extroverted for a short period of time but people are surprised when i tell them that it's like that what you see for like i don't know two hours a day maybe max uh, that comes from me being alone and happy on my own for about 22 hours a day (laughs) and that's perfectly fine right so for those that are introverts and they always look at those extroverted activities as you know a lot of energy that you need to expedite and you need to put out Why do you feel like it's important to build a brand that is separate from maybe their organization? Maybe they don't have their own business, but they work with an organization. And for me at first, that was that separation where I'm like, by myself, I just felt like I needed to have a branding around something that I didn't even have label for like I don't have a business yet but it was this idea of like I need to separate myself from this organization with my own thoughts my own ideas my own uh, way of doing things so why do you feel like it's important well and I think you hit the nail right there on the head Anka is your personal brand your thoughts that's what's creating that bridge of trust with the next person be it a potential client a potential collaborator whoever that person is People don't trust salespeople. So if we talk about our product and service all day long, we are not going to get anywhere. We are going to lose them. But when we start putting our personal thoughts and our personal thought leadership out there, we start to create that no like, and trust factor. And I know that's kind of the word of the year, right? To create that authenticity and no like, and trust factor. But it's so true. People begin to trust us beyond what our end product and service is. And so they start to get curious and they do ask us questions because they're already bought in. They want to work with you. They like you. They like what you're putting out there. So anything else you're doing with your organization, they want to learn about that as well. And I think that's where we need to encourage people to create a personal brand that Yes, it's a little bit separate from the organization, but you can pull stuff from your organization that you're passionate about, and then it creates a really powerful one-two punch. And where I see people doing this really well is if they work for an organization, let's say, that's really high on sustainability initiatives. And then you as the as the individual, you're also very passionate about green meetings and being sustainable. Wow, that is such a powerful way that you can uh, connect with your audience and create that no like, and trust factor. And once you know it, your product actually also speaks to that. So you can find ways of aligning with your corporate brand, but having a personal brand, to your point, Anka, it's not in conflict. The two can go side by side with one another to bring clients over that bridge, get them on the path to purchase, And now we can talk about our product and service because they already like us. They already trust us because we were able to bring them in with the more personal side of our brand. 
And that's what I love. And I think that's where the most successful brands can do it really well. And the most successful organizations respect that their employees can do this and they it can do it well. So we're seeing nowadays a lot of companies getting on board with personal branding and empowering their employees to have a brand. That didn't happen back in the day. And I don't know about you, Anka, but there was a lot of friction between what I was doing and what I was trying to sell with my business. I'm now with a company that is completely on board, but it wasn't always the case. And to no fault of their own, that wasn't the traditional way of doing things. But now the way we all do things, including corporate sales, it's changing. And our brands is a big part of that. I love that. And you're right. Like back in the days when I started doing this work on my own personal branding, I guess I have a a follow-up question to that because back in the days, at one point it became a trap apparently to the company that I was working with. And I was pulled over in the office and literally being, you know, questioned about where am I going with this? And to be honest, I didn't have like a laid out plan. Like I wasn't going to exit. That wasn't really part of my my strategy. But then I started actually thinking about an exit strategy because I'm like, sounds like I'm becoming too strong of a brand now and I am being a threat to them. So I need to have a bed laid out somewhere else <laughs> if this thing's, yeah. you know, if it doesn't work out. So I guess my question to you, do you still see this sort of like, you know, a split that eventually happens. I have at least two examples right now of people that I'm good friends with. I follow on LinkedIn. Brian Monahan is one of them. Actually, he was on my podcast not too long ago where he does personal branding really well, but also he has this company that he works for in a leadership position. And the two just, you know, they don't conflict, but they sort of like melt together. And then my friend, Cindy Cohn, she's in the same situation where her personal branding is so strong, yet the company that she works for supports that because it leverages her influence, it leverages her social impact and her social weight that she has. And that is a beautiful integration of how you can be a a strong uh, brand individually, but you can also support the organization that you work for. So have you seen situation uh, in your um, experience where this has worked really well and also examples where, well, this has not really worked that uh, that great. So then what do we do if you come to that point of like, oh gosh, I got to actually prepare for what's going to come next because it looks like I need an exit strategy. Yes. And, and so that conversation that you had, that uncomfortable conversation that you had where they were questioning your brand, I had that same conversation, Anka. So I think it happens a lot. And what you and I now knowing what we know, what you and I should have done differently is had the conversation with them first and said, hey, you know what? I really want to try this. I think this can work. I think this can drive more business to our organization if I'm able to draw them in with some of the more personal things about my professional life. So it's on the employee as well to have the conversation with their team lead and their organization to say, hey, you know what? I'm putting my hand up. I want to try things differently. Are you open to me doing this? And then having those conversations, having those questions, asking the organization, are there things that I can pull from the corporate brand that could work well with my professional brand, right? And having that dialogue. And that's where you and I, now knowing better, will do differently. But you and I, we missed that opportunity because I think we had a little bit of fear. We were afraid of what was going to be said when we said, hey, I've got a brand now and this is what I'm all about. We needed to make it more of a win-win for both. Mm -hmm. For organizations that support their employees, like Cindy, right? Cindy Cohn, I love her stuff. We're seeing more organizations that are supportive of that. But it's still an ongoing conversation with your employer. And if there becomes a frictional point like you, like me, where there isn't really an agreement made about how to project our personal brand as well as maintain the integrity of the corporate brand, then you and I have some decisions to make, Anka. We have some decisions to make that could be very difficult. It might mean you have to leave an organization to find one that's more like-minded like you. 
Because I think the worst thing an associate or an organization can do is stifle one's career journey in that way. Because as you know, those of us who have a personal brand, we are able to find positions a little bit easier than those that don't. And it has nothing to do with our skill set or our talents. It has everything to do with visibility. Mm -hmm. And so we as professionals, regardless of who we work for and work with, we have an obligation to ourselves to protect our career journey and be able to promote our professional accomplishments in a way that's comfortable. So I want to empower everyone that finding new opportunities does become a bit easier when you have that a little bit of increased visibility. When an organization is comparing two people with the exact same skill sets, talent for talent, the one that will win out is the one that can bring visibility to their products and services. So I think organizations are starting to see that and we want to empower people to start to see that about themselves as well. But I think there's also a fine line there, right? Like you want to be able to have that visibility, but it has to be a positive visibility Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. a lot of organizations, they don't want to take the risk of dealing with something that maybe is a little bit too extravagant or outside of the times, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. like, for example, for me, I knew that I have a voice. I knew that I have a strong voice and I have some strong opinions about things. So in the context of my situation, I honestly had no option but to go on my own to make my own rules Mm -hmm. because I knew I was going to talk about some things that are hard things that my uh, particular industry, like event production, women representation behind the scenes in events, they don't want to talk about. You know, Uh, nowadays, Mm -hmm. after all the talk I've had just in the last five years, people got tired of hearing it, but I'm I'm finally seeing some change, you know, because it does take someone to go outside of the norm and say, hey, I I don't like what's going behind the scenes. We need mm-hmm. to talk about this. And mm-hmm. to be honest, there was also a price to pay when that happened, right? Like mm-hmm. people don't want to like show all their mess and say, yeah, you're right. Like our rate of female to male technicians is like, non-existent. (laughs) We have work. It takes a really strong, authentic company or company head to say, I want to work on this. I want to make a difference. And I want to start with us because most of them, they just want to get their stuff done, their events done and at any means. Right. But if you look behind the hood, there's like a lot of things that are not okay. They're not fine. They're not right. And that puts women in a very precarious situation. So me being like the loud voice that I am, I'm like, I'm going to talk about these things. I'm going to mention some things that are not pretty, some things that are not all great, right? But somebody has to, because otherwise we're just going to keep doing the same thing for the next 20 years more. And then we are not attracting new talent. We're really enhancing the same practices, which are not productive. And yeah, it, it, it can be someone that's a risk taker, somebody that doesn't care maybe that much that, they might not be liked. (laughs) And, you know, going back to my personality, I am an Enneagram 8. So I thrive in, you know, having to go and dive into some difficult conversations and having to say things as they are, because I'm bold and I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty out there when it comes to uh, advocating for what's right and what's fair. But an introvert, someone that is a afraid is afraid to even put their thoughts out there or someone that's just a a person that wants to be liked right Mm -hmm. a people pleaser how can they leverage some of their influence Mm -hmm. to make an impact to bring on change when the common perception on you know most social media and in general is that media favors the extroverted the loud ones (laughs) Yeah, I know. I live that every single day. Believe me. But I think what happened with your uh, previous company, Anka, you know, even if we remove uh, branding from the conversation, there was a values misalignment. And I think that's the thing. It's easy to say, okay, I want to talk about these things because that's part of my brand. 
But even if you decided not to talk about those things, there was still a, a values misalignment with that organization. And so then you had that you probably would have left anyway. I mean, if you're not on the same, you know, on the, in the in the same direction and going down the same road together, you would have found a better fit for the things that you do want to talk about. But and I think that's where professionals really need to look at the intrinsic values and mission of your organization. If you're not in, in alignment with those, mm. your branding may not be in alignment with it as yeah. well. So make sure you're working with a company where your values and your mission align with one another. Absolutely. So going back to the second question to my question, <laughs> I love two, three part questions. Anybody yeah. that's listening to this podcast, you're like, okay, get to the question, woman. <laughs> <laughs> I love to hear from you some thoughts, some strategies on how introverts can leverage social media to build their brand, even if the common perception is that social media, like I said, favors mostly the loud ones, the extroverted ones. Yeah. I think there's a lot of different formats now on social media that are very introvert friendly. And I think, you know, Twitter, if you can remember Twitter, Twitter and LinkedIn do tend to favor the introverts because mm -hmm. they are about sharing our brand and sharing our thought leadership in a low risk environment. I think TikTok is a little bit of a, a dance, no pun intended, but that's a stretch for some introverts is to put themselves out there in such a visual form. Mm -hmm. But in written form, that's where the introverts really thrive. Introverts tend to spend more time thoughtful in their writing and in their conversation. And that's what LinkedIn is really all about. And that's why yeah. I'm a big lover and believer in LinkedIn is because it gives me the time I need to reflect on a topic and put my own thoughts together. Right, Anka? As, as introverts I love do, that. we put our own thoughts together. And then in a way that's comfortable, we can post it or share it on LinkedIn. And introverts aren't social media adverse. I think introverts just need to approach it from a more thoughtful and proactive angle versus a, a less reactive angle. But it's still, there's still lots of room on social media for introverts. And we need, and that I guess is more of a myth, myth busting about what introversion is. You and I having this conversation right now, Anka, is very, very comfortable for me because it's one-on-one. -on -one. And I know the podcast audience is, there's a lot of people out there, but I'm just talking to you right now. Yeah. Introverts love one-on-one -on -one conversations and yeah. we can look at social media as a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's not a one-to-many, which is usually in our world, Anka, when we're in that reception and there's a thousand it's overwhelming. in our space, that's where we start to break down a little bit. But yeah. these one-on-one -on -one conversations, hosting webinars, again, it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's just me and the webcam or you and your webcam. Those are easier activities for introverts because there is no thousand people in our room. It's just me and the yeah. camera lens or me and you having this conversation here. So there's lots of social media activities, lots of branding activities that introverts can absolutely get on board with. What we're going to refrain from doing is putting those introverts in those rooms and expecting them to network with a hundred new people in an evening. That one we have to take off the list. And that's fair. There's so many other things that we can do instead. You just put into words all the things that I know about myself, but I couldn't voice it that articulately because like I'm exactly, that's how all my posts on LinkedIn are happening. I have time to process my thoughts and then I can put them in a way that really is meaningful and authentic to what I'm thinking versus mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, I can be in a situation where I don't have time to process a lot of the things that I want to say. And and that kind of brings a lot of anxiety into mm -hmm. my, you know, to my, to myself, because I'm like, gosh, I don't think this is coming right the right way. And I wish I had time to write it down before I actually say it, you know, mm -hmm. and then you're right, like going out into the world to any networking when mm -hmm. you rather not and just have one-on-one -on -one conversations. That's yeah. like, that's a death sentence <laughs> for a lot of us. I yeah. hate it. I, as much as I'm an extrovert, like I said, on the outside, I don't know if you are. I hate it. I hate it. Now. Gosh, it's like, 
please send me send me with a friend or or just I'll find like a drink and talk to the drink by myself. <laughs> I'm okay. Just don't make me go and talk to strangers. <laughs> so I, don't I love your refreshing perspective on this. I have a feeling you're an introvert. I know you don't want to hear that, but you've got all. I the love to guys. be seen. <laughs> I love to be seen as an ambivert just because I have the extroverted, again, limited energy that I'm able to put out in a controlled fashion, but then I love to be an introvert for the rest of like of my days. You know, I was at South by Southwest and there were so many activations, so many sessions, so many conversations. As I was mentoring a women in technology. I was having all of those panels and Every single day, I would want to like literally make a beeline for the waterfront to be by myself so I can just have that quiet time in the middle of all of that craziness so I can recharge for a moment. And I feel like there's so much of that needed in our events when we talk about wellness, right? Like our mental capacity that is overtaxed when we have all of those agendas overly filled with one great things great educational sessions great conversations but for someone like me and you like we need to be able to retrieve somewhere quietly to recharge and recharging means just having a little bit of quiet time just having a me time so i don't have to be bombarded all the time with all the overstimulation i just started using i don't know if you heard of the loop earring earphones no, and no, what? No. Yeah. So it's uh, created by Google XI for neurodiverse people. Okay. So, like for example, you go to an IMAX that there's so much noise around you, and you're trying to have this conversation with this person in front of you, but you're like kind of distracted by all the things that are happening. Those earphones, they kind of dampen the outside noise by about anywhere between 10 dBs to about 14, depending on the model. But what happens is the way they, they're made, it focuses your attention on just the person in front of you. So when I'm at my desk and I need my kids to not be in my head, I put those on and I put on the 15 dBs, you know, a cut and and I'm just focusing on the task at hand. When I go out into the world, I use the 10 dBs ones. So I can still hear what happens around me, right? But I can focus my attention on the conversation that I'm having with this person in front of me. And it really helps my kind of like overstimulation to not go out of control because I'm like trying to pay attention to everything. <laughs> I it's really good. Headphones. Yeah, I could totally use those headphones. And and you raise an interesting point about neurodivergence. And I know we're getting off the topic of branding, but it's 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 important for event managers to see how introverts learn differently. Mm -hmm. And to your point, and they're getting better at it. I, I see a lot of events and event managers are doing a great job of accommodating different learning styles, which mm -hmm. does include building white space into the agenda so that we have those moments to kind of breathe and absorb yeah. what just happened or building in different areas, seating areas where one can process information all alone or in a small group. So yeah. event, event managers are getting much, much better at catering to different learning styles. And introverts, we have a different learning style. We absorb information differently. And so these headphones, I, I would love the link to them. Maybe put the link in the show I'll notes. I'll have to put it in the show notes. To check them out. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Now, before we uh, move on into our uh, next uh, uh, conversation question, which basically has to do with effective ways for professionals to build their personal branding. We're just going to take a quick break to highlight our podcast sponsor and supporter, and then we'll be right back. So don't go anywhere because we have so much more to talk with Leanne about all the things about personal branding. Before we move any further, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our main sponsor, Trifan Events, which is a boutique event planning and production agency that will come alongside you, offering personalized event planning and technical support, strategic event design, production and technology management, and flawless execution for live, virtual, and hybrid events. The team at Trifan Events is passionate about planning and producing event experiences that get people involved with true moments of interaction, engagement, and co-creation 
while offering white glove treatment throughout the entire planning process, enabling you to reach your event goals with the use of creativity, production tools, and event technology. To find out how Trifun Events can plan and produce your event become memorable, go to trifunevents.com. Welcome back, friends. If you're just joining us, we have Leanne Calderwood, LinkedIn and personal branding trainer and speaker, discussing why building a brand separates separate from your organization really matters. And we talked about refreshing perspectives on how introverts can navigate this extroverted world and how they can build their branding. Now, let's explore a few alternative strategies, Leanne. Beyond social media, what are some effective ways that professionals can leverage to build their personal branding? Maybe include some AI tools because I know you're passionate about that as well. Anything that you might use in your tool box on the everyday. Yes. Well, and, and that's a great, great point. I think we need to recognize that while social media is excellent at enhancing our visibility, we can do it without social media. Uh, and the example I like to use are those, especially in a service part of our industry, like the AV technicians, like the bartenders, where they can put their personal flair and provide service in such a way that it's cementing their personal brand. So you can do it straight through your service. CSMs are another great example of this, where they're working one-on-one -on -one with clients. Even through something as prosaic as our email communications, our out-of-office messages, the way that we leave voicemails, these are all little snippets and clues into our personal brand, where we can infuse some of our personality, fuse a bit of our passions, our values in those tiny ways. So anything written is a great way to promote our professional brand, and it doesn't have to be on social media. And of course, we can always do it in a networking room. This is going to work better for our extroverted friends. But the way you show up, the way you dress, the way you have maybe a signature piece of jewelry, or the way you style your hair, that's going to make you recognizable. And so people are going to start associating you with that thing or with that thing that's recognizable. And again, it's just a small way, but a very effective way to build that know, like, and trust factor and really to set you apart. If you, have, if you are able to do that in a networking room and set yourself apart with something as small as the briefcase you carry, people will remember that. And that's really the point of branding here. Branding creates recognition so that people remember your name or remember your face. And with repetition, then that know, like, and trust factor starts to build and we start talking about business. So I hope that helps. I hope that's a few ways that can get people kind of on the right direction. When it comes to AI, you know, I've been using chat GPT, as you know, in a ton of my content creation, be it creating, helping create blog posts, helping create some social media posts, even show notes for podcasts. So chat GPT has really fed into one of the things I believe about personal branding and that is to make it easy. I think when people decide they're going to create a brand, they feel that there's all of this work ahead of them to kind of get going. And what ChatGPT has done is it's just made it a little bit easier. So we're not cheating. Notice I didn't use the word cheating, just easier. And if there are tools that can help you do anything in your business easier and more effectively where you can be more productive, you should be getting on board with that. So I think personal branders are using chat GPT to help make their brands amplify just a little bit easier. I love that. I'm going to go back to something that you said in the beginning, and then we're going to come back to this. ChatGPT is an example, a case study. And so before I even, you know, thought about potentially making one statement of my outfit or of like what I wear as part of my branding, I was always wearing those darker black uh, boots with like some white flowers on it when I would go to uh, events like IMAX where there's a lot of walking because they are so comfortable. So lower 
and behold, <laughs> little did I know, but people started associating my Docker's boots with my bread, with myself. And they would be like, I know you buy your boots. <laughs> yes, right? As simple as a pair of boots. It they happens. would pay attention to my boots and then they will recognize, remember who I am. And I like it, like it was so funny to me that that was, you know, a, a thing that they would remember about me. Then I started thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? If that's going to be part of my branding, might as well go out and buy a few more boots. So I don't look like I'm only wearing one pair all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually have several of the same boots, same model, same design, and then a few other colors as well. But now that has become kind of like my signature outfit element of whatever I'm wearing, there's going to be some boots associated with that. So you see me on stages, I'm always wearing some Dockers. You see me, you know, on some event side, I'm always wearing some Dockers. So it's funny how those two, you know, sort of like blended together. Again, me without even thinking that that would become part of my brand. <laughs> whatever you're wearing a lot, just be cognizant of the fact that it might become part of your brand. So you be strategic about it. You, you well, better <laughs> right? And there, and therein lies the word. You are now strategic about it. It was an accidental part of your brand, but now yes. you've put thought into it. And I think so. My definition of personal branding. One of the words in my definition is the word intentional. And so you went from being unintentional, just wearing boots that were comfortable, that was comfortable. now being yeah. very intentional. You've got your stock of boots. You're not going to wear anything but those boots. That's a decision that you are making. And that's where you create that know, like, and trust factor with your audience. So that's a brilliant, brilliant example of how someone can be intentional in their brand. And it has nothing to do with social media right? You are, you are not on social media with your I, I wasn't you even like interested in following dockers or being so yeah. interested. It was just a pair of boots that became so comfortable. And you know, when you walk 20,000 steps in a day, that's a major must have a pair of shoes that are comfortable, whatever yeah. that is for you. And you're right. Like that became for me, that pair of shoes. And then lo and behold, they're part of my branding now. Yeah. <laughs> love it. I love it. Love it. So hopefully your, your listeners will pick up on that and start to think about, okay, is there something in the way I show up that I can intentionally amplify in the same way that Anka is intentionally amplifying her boots? <laughs> I should be getting Love some it. kickbacks from doctors because I feel like Absolutely. those are not cheap boots, but yeah. you know, it's like, I am obviously wearing them a whole lot and here's free advertising. So the company's struggling. So it's, yeah. it's, it's okay. It's good. <laughs> so going back to the other thing that you said about ChatGPT, here's a, an example that I feel like for anyone that's listening and they're kind of like on the fence, well, is it really like not cheating if I'm asking, you know, an AI bot LLM to write this blog piece for me? Actually, here's what I do. And I would love to hear some of your thoughts. Like, for example, I get my best ideas every morning. I take a shower. I get a new content idea. I kid you not. There's two places where I get fresh ideas. One is working out when I'm in the gym. My brain has that white space to just be, you know, relax and just focus on thoughts and new ideas while my body is going through this fitness routine. And then I'm on the white noise, I guess, when you take a shower, that also amplifies mm -hmm. a bit of that creativity. So I get this idea and I get out of the shower and the first thing I do, I literally like go to my phone mm -hmm. and I have the app, mm -hmm. the ChatGPT app where you can speak into it. And mm -hmm. I put down those notes, like notes. If I don't, and before ChatGPT, I used to put it in a text message to myself because I yeah. kid you not, if I don't and I go and get started with my day, <laughs> there goes my awesome idea. And I'm like, what was I thinking yeah. that I wanted to talk about? And now I can't remember for the life of me. So I mm -hmm. go to my ChatGPT app and I say, okay, please, um, like, here's what I'm thinking. And I kind of put out, <laughs> lay out the thought process of what this thought is, what, what I want to write about. Like if it's like, I want to write a LinkedIn post about this, 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 and this. So I give it all the directions. I give it my thoughts. And then what I ask it to do is please elaborate on this thought. 
And yeah. now the ChatGPT actually knows my voice, knows my style, mm-hmm. because there's a little bit of training that you mm-hmm. have to do to make sure that you write articles that are kind of like in your mm-hmm. voice, in your tone, mm-hmm. in your style. Mm-hmm. It literally mm-hmm. lays out the LinkedIn post that he already knows how many characters he has to have. He already yeah. knows my style, how I talk. He already knows the hashtags he has to have because it's yeah. all built in my settings, in my own chat GPT. And I have my post ready for when it's time to schedule it for mm-hmm. my next week. Because I many times I would schedule in advance because I have, mm-hmm. again, daily, daily thoughts and many, many times more than one <laughs> thought yeah. that I I put more content that LinkedIn has time to process and like, I better work with this algorithm, which I love to dive into a little bit more. So that's kind of my process. So your Mm -hmm. your thought, what you just said, you're not cheating when you're using ChatGPT, you're elaborating, you're enhancing what Mm -hmm. you already have as the original creative thought or thought leadership that you want to put out there into the world. For me, this process has made it so much easier because otherwise opposite of this would have been i have the thought i'm gonna sit on my phone and try to like write this like amazing linkedin post and i don't mm-hmm. like how it sounds and it doesn't represent what i'm thinking and i give up i'm like you know what i don't have time for this forget it like forget about this you know what i mean and i bet and a lot of introverts fall like especially perfectionists a little bit fall in that trap If they don't have the extra tool support to help them, just get it out there. Like forget about perfection, get it out there. Well, and you, you've said so many incredible things in that, but the one thing that I really want to um, focus on first before I lose my thought, right? Because I'm not (laughs) checking (laughs) it out and I know it's my thought is you said, if you had to write it out on your own without tool support, that it's not coming out the way that you kind of really want it to come out. With ChatGPT or any other tool support, we're actually doing a better service to our audience because now our audience is going to read something that does sound like you because you had ChatGPT help you out along the way. So I would much rather get that post, Anka, the one that you use tools to enhance that's going to make my day better as the reader of your content than if you were to try to slog through it on your own, put something out that wasn't really what you wanted to say, but because we're introverts, we're like trying to jam all of it in. And then I don't get anything out of it as a reader, or it's not coming across in a way that's congruent. So this is where ChatGPT makes it easier for us to communicate with our audiences. And so if you're struggling with writing, yes, you've got to lean on ChatGPT because guess what? You have the right to edit it and make it sound like you, add things that maybe it forgot or delete things that you didn't want added. So ChatGPT, in my opinion, isn't actually this massive time saver, but it is a brain saver. And that's kind of how I look at the tool is it's kind of diving into my brain because to your point, We're priming it with all this information. We're using it repeatedly so it gets to know us. And then it pulls it out of us into a form that our audience is going to resonate with. It's all about the audience. And if ChatGPT is going to help my audience with their day and their life, absolutely I'm going to use it. 100% 100%. 100% times over. So anyways, I'll get off my soapbox about that because I think a lot of people are resisting chat GPT because they think, oh, it's not going to sound like me and it is cheating. Well, no, it's not going because you're going to spend all of that time in the beginning training the tool so it sounds like you, giving it the right primer, primer so it sounds like you. And in the end, it isn't about you anyway. It's about the person on the other end reading your content or reading your show notes or listening to this podcast. So quit making it about you and your ego and make it about the other person. And ChatGPT is going to be your best friend to do that. I love it because I was going to say just that. It's like, get over yourself. Okay, just get over Mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you have something smart to say, please let it be out there (laughs) and use tools that will help you support that. Now, 
with that, I want to dive a little bit into challenges. I mean, this can be a challenge, right? For some people that I'm like, I have things to say. I just don't want to say it like, like in a way that is not received well. Now, in your personal mm -hmm. branding, you, you, you build a success, be, successful business around your brand. Can you share some of the challenges that you have faced along the way and how you were able to overcome them for anyone that's listening and that may be in the beginning mm -hmm. journey of starting their own personal brand? Yeah. Well, and I think the biggest challenge, this is one that we all go through, but especially as introverts, is believing that we have the right to a personal brand mm. because we may have spent decades in that corporate world, right? Where we were just a worker bee and working for, you know, quote the man or the woman. And we didn't feel that we had a voice. You have a voice. Everyone has a voice. You also have things that make you different from anyone else in your industry, anyone else in your department, anyone else on your team. And they could be as simple as you know how to slay an Excel spreadsheet when other people are struggling. That can be your superpower. You might have the ability to communicate complex ideas. That can be your superpower. You might have the ability to connect people. Extroverts in the room, this one's for you. You have the ability to connect like-minded people so that they have collaboration. That's your superpower. We all have something that we can do better, we can think better, we can communicate better than anyone else around us. And that's where we start with our personal brand. So that's one challenge, is just getting people to believe that you have a story to tell, you have something to talk about, and you have something that's gonna help someone else. There are millions of people out there struggling with something that you know how to do very well. So do them a service and get your stuff out there and start to communicate with it. Now, another challenge is that writing thing. And I know extroverts and introverts, both alike, we struggle with the writing, especially on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is considered that thought leadership platform. But can I challenge you to start with LinkedIn polls? LinkedIn polls is a great way to start your thought leadership, but also start conversations without a ton of writing. And what I love about polls is it gives the reader an easy way to vote, right? Because it's a poll. So it's an easy way for someone to register their own opinion and register their own thought leadership. And then you create that engagement and then you get those insights. So when you do a poll and you've got 20 people voting on the poll, look at the results of that poll. Though that can give you some really great intel about your audience, about your industry, whatever it is that your poll is about. So LinkedIn isn't just about these run-on written posts. And I know once you get to that point, those are very effective and Anka is there, I am there. But if you're just starting out on LinkedIn, start with a poll. Man, that has, there's power in that. Start with an image. There's great power in that. And if it's not an image of yourself, it's an image of a team member or an image of a place or an image of something. It could even be just an image of your work setup. I'm always fascinated with your work setup, Anka, because you've got like thousands of screens, right? And it's like those behind the scenes moments, man, there's power in that. People want to see the real you. So give them a screenshot of your work. Give them a screenshot of what you do on the day to day. I know I'm rambling on here, but I think this is going to help people get over those initial hurdles about, I don't have anything to talk about. I don't know how to talk about it. And where do I get started? So hopefully this gives you a few ideas on how to get started. I love that. I honestly, I it almost like you talked about this journey that I went on personally to share more of myself, of behind the scenes, aside from my professional self, right? Because I feel like there's um, a bit of that on LinkedIn. Like on Facebook, there's a little bit of everything. And I honestly, like I can't always stand Facebook because of that. But on LinkedIn, it's like you're supposed to put this like professional version of you out there at all times what people don't realize is that when they do that you're really like not relatable 
-hmm. Like you don't make yourself very relatable in so many ways. So Mm -hmm. it occurred to me that people want to know the real me, the person that they talk with on the phone on a one-on-one conversation, the people, the person they see on Zoom and it's Anka, the relaxed version, right? No, I do it so professional, uptight, all of that, right? And I hated the idea that that's what I'm projecting mm-hmm. when in reality, I'm actually a pretty fun person to be around. <laughs> I'm not all that, like, I'm not my LinkedIn image, you know, like a, a mm-hmm. headshot. Mm-hmm. And I started this series of personal posts, which was like a literally hashtag on weekends. Mm-hmm. And I allow myself to go behind the scenes on a weekend. And I said, okay, I don't want to make my LinkedIn like the soap opera of personal posts, but I want one time a week on a Saturday or a Sunday to talk a little bit about myself, about my upbringing, about what makes me who I am, what makes me think, what makes me the think the, th- the way I think, what makes me the person that I am, the professional that I am, what are the challenges that I had to overcome to be here? Like I, it's not all flowery and beautiful and rosy. There's challenges that we all have that we have to overcome through this growth journey that we're all on, right? So the moment I started doing that, what's funny actually, because I uh, constantly go back to my analytics on LinkedIn because I'm a little bit of an analytics <laughs> uh, nerd, but those personal posts have more impressions and more comments and they they touch more lives and people message me more about those than any of the other like LinkedIn professional, professional posts. <laughs> It goes to say that people want to connect to people. They want to connect to your story. They want to connect to who you are behind your LinkedIn headshot. And some of you, by the way, you need to update that LinkedIn headshot because when I meet you in person and you don't look like the LinkedIn headshot, it throws me off. (laughs) Right. So true. But you, you said something so telling people love stories and it's because they can relate to the story in some way, shape or form. So you sharing things that you've gone through, other people have gone through it or they've gone through a version of it. And so when they see someone share that, they feel almost a permission to feel the way they feel. And so that's what creates such great engagement be it LinkedIn or Facebook or otherwise, is when you share those stories, you're giving permission to your audience to feel with you and alongside you. And that's why the engagement is so great on storytelling. It's something we can't do every day because we do need to talk about all the other things that our brands are about. But that is why our personal posts and our storytelling do do so well. And it'll continue to do well. You'll see. And it's a great segue also in the things that you said about branding that it it has to be easy, authentic and accessible. And I'd love for you to expand on that and perhaps maybe share some first steps for listeners that can take today if that concept is new for them. So and that's where the accessible part is, is everyone can access a personal brand. And how you get started is simply by just finding that one thing, that one thing that you feel that you can start to have a conversation about. And and the other thing that we need to, to, and as, as meeting and event professionals, we all know this, is come back and make sure that you're solid on the goals or the why you want to create a brand. Some of you may be wanting to create a brand so that you can attract more business. That's something that I did when I first got started. Or maybe you're creating a brand because you're looking ahead to future job opportunities. Or maybe you just want to connect with other like-minded individuals and be also considered a thought leader. Whatever your goals are, that will help drive some of the things that you start to talk about. But before we start with a whole bunch of things to talk about, let's just find one. And let's just start talking about it. And again, making it easy, start with a LinkedIn poll or start with a conversation starter, like a a question and, and have people. And that's the great thing about LinkedIn, again, for introverts is once we start those conversations on LinkedIn, those conversations find themselves in the networking room and you didn't even have to say a word right? You started the conversation on one platform and then people start to come to you to continue the conversation in those networking environments, in those conferences and events. So those are, I think, some easy ways to get started, authentic ways to get started. 
And again, personal branding is, is accessible to anybody and everybody. So make sure that you tap into your strengths and your powers and start talking about it. I love it. I love the fact that you, you know, you said how some of those topics, some of the things that you talk about in a post, you know, can most, most likely is going to make itself out into a networking uh, opportunity, which for me has been the case many times, so much so that I had to create a process for myself to take all of those LinkedIn posts and, and like literally take them into notion. So I have them because Again, as someone that put out a uh, post like on a daily, I would, you know, run into someone and I would bring something that I wrote maybe like two weeks ago. And my mind is like, I don't even remember <laughs> what happened yesterday. So I need to create a process to have all my LinkedIn posts come into my notion, like almost like a collection of blog posts. Right. And I'm like, oh, now I can go back to that or can even like re rewrite that in a with a lesson learned or something that is a follow-up to that particular instance or challenge or whatever I shared about. So talking about processes, I, I'm all about processes when it comes to businesses, when it comes to my own business. And I would love to hear from you the role of consistency as a mm -hmm. process that plays in personal branding and how can professionals ensure that they're consistently projecting their brand values. Like I said, like you said, you're going back to that why, why do you even want to have a brand in the first place? I want to hear more about the role of consistency and the process uh, of doing that in a way that is aligned with mm -hmm. your brand values. I'm also a process geek. So I just want to finish kind of that note about process and Notion is a great platform. My son actually uses Notion for his YouTube business. I use Google Docs. So anything you see from me posted on LinkedIn didn't originate actually on LinkedIn. It originated in a Google Doc. And so I can now go back to all of my LinkedIn posts, going back literally years and years and repurpose some of my some of my content. So now we're talking about that consistency. On LinkedIn, in order to in order to have a consistent brand, you really only need to post once or twice a week, which is again why I love LinkedIn because it takes a bit of the pressure off. Some mm -hmm. of those other platforms, you need to do it a little bit more to have a consistent face. On LinkedIn, once or twice a week is all that's needed. And now I'm going to geek out on the algorithm. The algorithm on LinkedIn does give your post more shelf life. And so if you post something a few days ago, people are still seeing it in their home feed today. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen on some of the other platforms. You post it one day and 24 hours later, it's fizzled off. The algorithm yeah. isn't giving it any push anymore. LinkedIn's a bit different. It still continues to push out content days later. So, so that I want you to be encouraged with that is you don't have to post every day like Anka or even like myself, but once a week to be consistent on the platform. And how we stay organized and consistent is having a content calendar, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or a journal or Notion or some other CRM tool, putting your thoughts and putting your ideas in a content calendar will help you create those posts when the time comes. Like Anka, you could batch them in advance and schedule them out, but even just jotting down your ideas so that when April 30th comes around, you know you're going to do a post on such and such and yeah. so so, so having a content calendar has saved my social media mess because like you, Anka, I'm on a bunch of different platforms, not just LinkedIn, but my content calendar keeps me organized and using tools to make it easy, right? Using Google Docs, using yeah. Notion, using ChatGPT, saving all of those links, et cetera, so that when you do run out of content ideas six months from now, Here's what you're going to do is you're going to go back to that idea you posted today and you're going to edit it a little bit. You might add a little bit and you're going to repost it again. No one is going to remember six months from now what you posted today. Only you will remember. But if you can repurpose it, that gives you an opportunity to get more content out there with less bandwidth. So content creation is accessible to all when you have the right tools in your toolbox. So arm your toolbox, get some processes in place, and you can be a content creator. 
I love that. I love the idea of repurposing content, especially because I create a lot of video content as well. Repurpose.io has been such a time saver for me because I live in the now, like a lot of us live in the now. And sometimes I'm thinking, well, if I post about this that happened yesterday, it's already like old news. But to someone that have hasn't even seen it yesterday, it's not all news. To my mind, it's all news, right? Because I'm already like living into the next, in the future. I'm like, oh, what am I going to talk about tomorrow? What am I going to do yeah. tomorrow, right? So yeah. having a calendar, like you said, to, re- to schedule things, that's where if I schedule things, I don't have to think about it anymore. It's going to go out and it's going to be posted as I intended to without the pressure of like, but is that like all news now? Or is it <laughs> like, I feel like it's all news, but it's only to me, right? It's like, because my mind is always constantly moving forward. So having a, a, some kind of organization method for yourself, it's so important. You're right, especially to stay consistent. It's like the same way I apply the same princip- principles in my bodybuilding training and uh, routine. If I were if I weren't consistent with my training, I wouldn't be competing. That's just the reality of things. You cannot get from step A to step Z without walking all the daily steps and being consistent about it. And I feel like consistency is such an overlooked you know, term. It's, it's stronger than discipline. I don't always, or motivation. I don't always feel like wanting to go into the gym, but because consistency is part of my daily habit, I'm going to be there every Mm -hmm. single day and I'm Mm going to do the things that I need to do because I have a goal for myself. And the only way I can do that is because I'm consistent about it on a daily. Right. So same thing applies to anything in life, like not just content creation, but business building, like talk to five people every single day and be consistent about it and see where that might take you. Just saying. So I feel like we have so much to talk about because there's so much more to be said, but we got to come to sort of like an end here. And one of the questions that I always love to ask my future guest is uh, related to the demanding nature of our work, of our industry, and how do you maintain your mental and physical well-being uh, in the midst of it all, regardless of all the challenges, regardless of... uh, Many, many times juggling so many different things and responsibilities and projects at once. So I want to hear from you. How do you maintain your mental and physical well-being in the middle of all the projects? Sure. And you're right. It's it's everyone has a different way of managing their their well-being. So this is a little glimpse into my world. And as a type A person, I think systems and processes has saved me. And I and I think it has for you as well, Anka. So Having great systems in place, which includes batching tasks, Mm -hmm. that's a big system I really prescribe to. So I batch similar tasks that need to be done for a week or a month's time into one time block, as opposed to trying to do a little bit each and every day. So batching has certainly helped with my bandwidth. Having SOPs in place in my business has helped with my bandwidth. And then on a personal note, I do work out in the morning. I'm not an Anka kind of working outer and I love to go for runs as well as do workouts in my basement, but I do have better days when I work out when on days that I don't and being on the Pacific coast, there's some mornings I can't get to it because I'm on a call because I'm earlier than the rest of the world. It's just not that great of a day. So having a good workout in the morning or going for a run in the morning, having systems in place. And regularly scheduling conversations with like-minded people, be it a people in a mastermind, people in the industry, having conversations with those regularly. Yes, it's time in my calendar, but I feel so fed after those conversations and that energizes me to finish my week. So those are my, I guess, tips and hacks for keeping it all together. But I don't know about you, Anka, but when I create a system, And I find more bandwidth because I've got all my systems in place and everything's clickety-boo. And then I've got this thing, a white space. I'll fill it with something else. (laughs) And so I think that's the danger, right? Is we, if we're going to create white space, let's honor that white space. And actually take the time, especially as an introvert, take the time to kind of rest in that white space and not feel like you have to be productive every single second of the day. And I can, you know, relate to that problem. (laughs) 
We um, do. I do love calendar blocking. And I feel like as all of the things that you just said are very much aligned with my processes because to do um, a competition, which is very, very taxing for anyone that hasn't uh, done anything of that nature, it's it's a lot of bandwidth, mental, physical, nutrition, like just thinking about what am I going to eat now that, uh, next that's within my macros every single day. That takes bandwidth. And for me, calendar blocking is what keeps everything organized and running like oiled machine. When people are, are asking me, how can you do all the things that you do? it's because of what you just said because of the fact that I keep myself very organized I have systems in place I do calendar blocking like nobody's business I mean my husband wants to get on a date with me better be on the calendar my kids want to go to the park it better be on the calendar. I kid you not. Like to someone that's like not a calendar person and leave their life. Like, I don't know, like how things, whatever, how things are flying. It this might sound like madness, but I promise you now I can find time for that focus time or for that white no white space or for that nap in the middle of the day that I know I need because I started my day at 5 a.m. with a run and now I'm exhausted at 2 p.m. Right. I block yeah. it. And it has saved me the mental capacity needed to constantly have to rethink my day. And another thing that I, I like to do, I don't know about you, about your process, but I do that on a Sunday before the week starts. Like I go on my calendar and I look at the week ahead. I'm like, okay, this is how I'm like, I'm already mapping my week ahead so that I know what to expect. I guess as a type A, as a introvert, I Control is a big thing, but also knowing what to expect. I don't Mm -hmm. like surprises. I don't know about you, but I don't like a lot of surprises. And life is full of surprises. So if I can mitigate some of that, I'll do my best to do so. (laughs) So, and I'm just like you, Anka. Friday afternoon is when I'm looking ahead. I also do a quarterly review. I also do part of my month, my morning routine is looking at my schedule for the day and getting it all as well in my um, full focus planner. That's what saved me too, is my full focus planner. So yeah, I'm just like you. I mean, yes, time blocking is great, but you need to adhere then to your calendar. You need to actually yes. do the things in the calendar. You can't just put it in the calendar. True. And it's done. You actually have to go through with it. So I love it. Well, I hope that both me and you can find also balance to also leave that <laughs> open space open when it happens to be. <laughs> I know. Not try to fill it in with yet another task, which we know we can find easily. So I look forward to uh, more conversations like this. I love the fact that you mentioned so much about personal uh, personal branding, but also innovation, personal growth, so much goodness that was had in this conversation. And I love your journey into your own personal branding story. And I feel like that's so inspiring, but but also practical, like very practical. And I love practical things. Like don't sell me rainbows. Tell me what I can do now to support my growth right now, right? So I love your sharing and your wisdom that you have shared with us. Where can our audience connect with you if they want to learn more about all the, I know you do workshops, you actually do consultancy and you lead conversations as well as speaking engagement, where they can do to connect with you. The best place to learn about everything that I do around branding and LinkedIn can be found on my website over at leannecalderwood.com. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, for everyone that has joined us, thank you so much for doing so. Thank you, Leanne, for helping us build our brand and making your mark in the events world with your very strong personal branding and showing all of us that it's possible and how it can be done. I will see you hopefully at our next IMAX. (laughs) IMAX it might be, (laughs) yeah. I am so thankful for our conversation today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. I really enjoyed the opportunity to chat with you. Anytime with you, Anka, is a good day. So thank you. Thank you so much. 
All right. And in closing, all of you listeners, thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. If you're looking to dive deeper into the world of personal branding, make sure that you follow Leanne's work on connect with her on her website or find her on LinkedIn. And don't forget, we also have several upcoming AI boot camps, workshops, and LinkedIn lives all listed on Trifan Events website, which are designed to empower you further in your event planning and personal branding and business growing journey. Check out the website for more details and to sign up. While there, do check out our AV production GPT that is trained on an extensive data set of AV and AI tools with the only goal being to provide you with that expert advice and solutions to optimize event performance and impact while ensuring budget efficiency and attendee engagement. Now, a little side note to that, you do have to have ChatGPT Pro, the ChatGPT 4 in order to use any custom made GPT. So if you haven't been able to use it, I am very sorry, but maybe there is some benefit to having the pro version, which I personally have had a lot of benefits from. Lastly, don't forget to follow us on all our social channels for updates on future episodes, on industry insights, and much more. We're here to keep you ahead of the curve in the ever-changing world of events. Thank you for tuning in to the Events Demystify podcast. I'm Anka Platon Trifan. And until next time, stay curious, stay innovative, and above all, stay connected. We're shaping the future of events together. Catch you on our next adventure into the world of event planning and technology. Goodbye for now. And remember, the future is now. Thank you for listening to the Events Demystified podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to review it, rate it, and share it with other event professionals that could benefit from it. Connect with us on social at Events Demystified Podcast. We would love to hear from you and what you're up to. If you'd like to learn more about Tree Fan Event Services and find out if we're a good fit in supporting your event, can we help your event be successful with a 20-minute free consultation? Link in the episode's notes. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks so much for tuning into this exciting conversation. Make sure you follow and subscribe to Events Demystified Podcast to stay in the know about all of our upcoming episodes featuring some amazing guests.